Let's go. He's Derek. Category is Shady. Oh. <laughs> Ooh, that's right, girl. She's Romaine. I am a horny lesbian. I like to have sex. If I was single, I'd be having sex. This is Derek and Romaine. 2.0, bitches. Hey, hey. How's it going, Derek? Hey, hey, in the hayloft. Ants in your pants, 1939. Derek here. Along with Romaine and uh, joining us in a few minutes, my uh, high school pal, Rich Haddam, is going to be back with us. Oh, I love him. He's a sweetheart. Uh, me too. Uh, and uh, as I have explained in the most tortured way possible, we went to the same high school uh, and would have been in the high school at the same time if I had joined that high school in my freshman year when he was a senior, but I didn't arrive until I was a sophomore Uh and he had already graduated. But we have overlapping friends in common. And I met him uh, because uh, at the time uh, he was dating the older sister of a friend of mine. Uh And also I had uh, an ongoing the they he and no one else knew this at the time, but I also had an ongoing uh, sexual relationship with uh, one of the friends that he had graduated with. Oh, uh, also, yeah, hmm. uh, Larry, aka Lawrence, and uh, anyway, <laughs> we huh, we t- I uh, I saw Rich recently in Los Angeles, which you'll hear a bit more about in our interview in a few minutes. Mm-hmm. But um, and then we did we did talk a little bit about my uh, past with Larry. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay, who now goes by Lawrence? But you know, it's one of these things when um, you know uh, people will have a birth name, and then when they are kids, they will have some kind of shortened version of it, right? Um, and cause it's a bit more childlike. Sure. And then, uh, when they become adults, they want to have the adult version of their name. Some people stick with it, uh, over time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then sometimes they don't. I'll be curious to see what Romy does in this respect. If she wants to go by Romaine later on. I think that I, I mean, I would want to, if I were her, but cause I went by Ro as a girl. That was yeah. my nickname. And then as I became an adult, I transitioned into Romaine because Romaine is a much cooler name. But I don't know what Romy will do. It'll be interesting to find out. I think she's well, I think she's gonna stick with Romy, but who knows? Uh I frequently call you Ro. Although when she's at school, she goes by Romaine a lot. I did not know that, but evidently she does. Yeah, maybe she's growing up. Maybe she's growing into her adult name. Maybe. But this is Lawrence is now Lawrence fully, but Mm -hmm. he was Larry in colloquially in high school. And then, you know, when we were having sex, I called him Larry. And then, you know, we have uh, continued to have contact over time, but not such that I wouldn't continue to call him Larry around him. But it was funny because uh, Rich, who still is around him and everything, uh, apparently is calling him Lawrence. Like, all right, that's fine. But people also call, because Rich, his professional name is Richard. You know, Richard had him. Uh, but I still call him Rich because that's what I called him in, you know, yeah, yeah. when I was in high school. And uh, I don't think he minds that I call him Rich. I think he's I think he's fine either way. Right. Uh, it's also different in Hollywood because frequently, like, actors or directors or whatever, they will have their professional name because when the, for your credits... Uh, to not be confusing, you register your name with the the guild that right. you're in, and uh, you frequently can't have the same name as somebody else. This is why uh, Ben Patrick Johnson professionally went by Ben Patrick Johnson because the uh, actor Ben Johnson was still alive mm-hmm. when Ben Patrick Johnson uh, was like joining SAG. And so he needed to have, uh, you know, a way to distinguish his name. Ben Johnson is now dead. Uh, and, uh, you know, BPJ, as we also call him, uh, uh, still goes by Ben Patrick Johnson. But that right. reason that he did that was because of another uh, another actor having the name. I assume that's why Samuel L. Jackson is mm. Samuel L. Jackson. That makes sense. Uh, and, uh, you know, why you will see actors with... Uh, using different names, right? Uh, than their given name, and and but sometimes actors change their names for simplicity, for like on a marquee, or 
like Kim Novak, when she became an actress, the uh, they wanted to um, uh, her name was uh, Marilyn Pauline Novak. That was her birth name. Okay. And but they didn't want her to go by Marilyn Novak because Marilyn Monroe was a big star. And they told her, like, you have to change your name. Oh. And that she they wanted to change her last name too, but she was like, No, I wanna I wanna keep Novak. I'll change my first name to Kim, but I wanna I wanna keep my last name. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. But then, you know, Joan Crawford was born Lucille Lesseur, and I'm sure she couldn't fucking wait to get away from that. I think it's amazing how many uh, celebrities get some kind of stage name. Because, I mean, it's just, it's wild. Well, I mean, for you, you were born Romaine Patterson, and you remain Romaine Patterson. Because my name is fucking awesome. Mine is a stage name. Yes. <laughs> like, there I was is no born reason with a to change name. it. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. memorable uh, in and of itself. Yeah. It's unique. Uh, but also, it's not, even though people do spell Romaine wrong all the time. All the time. They drop the E off of it as if that's some kind of more common spelling, which I don't understand. Because the lettuce is spelled the With same the way e. you spell your name. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense at all why people misspell your name, because there are not many other alternate spellings. Now, with Derek, there are other spellings of Derek. And uh, like an oil Derek is has two R's and an I-C-K. Yep. There are some Derek's that have two R's, D-E-R-R-E-K. Or uh, like they people always try to make the spelling more complicated than yep. it needs to be. Uh, but uh, it is uh, it's not that bad. But I wasn't born Derek Hartley. And that became my name over time. And. Uh, that's fine. It's more memorable. But it was like I changed it as a stage name or something. But just in life, the my my name, my mom's name, went through a lot of iterations in my childhood. Right. And then finally, we stuck with a name that we liked. <laughs> but you know, there are there are good reasons why my name is Derek Hartley. Good reasons why my mother's name is Tracy Hartley. But for a good chunk of both of our lives, those were not what our names were. Yeah. Anyway. I know you guys, you guys and your changing of your names. Yeah. Well, the name is a, it's a, that's a funny thing, mm-hmm. but you know, that, you know, with Jonathan, most people, uh, more recently were calling him John because he went through this thing where when he was a kid, he went by Johnny. Like oh, his okay. mom calls him Johnny. Right. And uh, and then when I think that when he like went to college, he's like, no, I'm not going to be Johnny. I'm I'm a serious person. I want people to take me. I'm Jonathan. Johnny's not so a serious I, name. No, 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 no. When I you know, when I met him, he was going by Jonathan. But I think he relaxed a bit of that over time and then wanted people to call him John. But I always just called him uh, Jonathan. And he uh, he himself, he would only call himself Johnny in relation to his uh, nephew. He had a nephew uh, that he really uh, loved. And uh, so he would call himself Uncle Johnny because he was, within the family, he was Johnny still. And so he would call himself Uncle Johnny when he was talking about, like, his, like, nephew in that context. But the rest of the time, uh, he, he was going by John or Jonathan. But it just, you know... I am a little bit jealous of people who have had uh, names that could be modified in some ways because Derek, it's just Derek. Like, yeah, it's not, you can't really change. Not Derek. easy. But you if you come... had a nickname, what kind of nickname would you have wanted? Oh, I definitely. You know me. I would not want a nickname. I wouldn't want anyone to call me anything. Absolutely not. Okay. So no. No, Derek is fine. Derek. Now, my sister Tiffany, she. Uh, we would shorten her name sometimes just a little. We would sometimes call her Tiff, but she never really went by Tiff. Like, oh, call me Tiff. Like right. she never, that was never a thing. She was always Tiffany. Uh, uh, but she also did not like uh, like nicknames and everything. And part of it was when we were growing up, um, uh, Bjorn's old last name, because he also was not Bjorn. 
Like for part of our childhood, he wasn't Bjorn either. Like he changed his name. All of us changed our names except my sister. She changed her last name, but not her first name. But everybody else and I didn't change my first name, only my last name. But uh, everybody in my immediate family changed some part of their name as I was growing up. Mm. Like every every last one of us. Uh, and part of it was we were kids, so we sort of, our last names became a part of the evolution of what our parents were going by. Sure. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but um, uh, my sister was teased a bit because of Bjorn's original last name, which I'm not going to go into here. And so she really did not like nicknames or anything else because she didn't want to open herself up to that kind of teasing. But uh, my mom and I, I mean, this is not a secret or anything, but... Uh, my mom would sometimes call her uh, Tiffy or Niffy, mm-hmm. but, hi- but not to her face <laughs> or the Niffer. The so, Niffer. So we would do that all the time. So it's Niffy, Niffer, Sniffy for Snifferous. Yeah, for yeah. Snifferous? Like, yeah, yeah. What kind Tiffery. of name is for Snifferous? I mean, I had Grody Rody, but, you know. But, like, not, not. Not to, like I wouldn't like call her Niff to her face or Niffer or anything like that. And it wasn't meant in like a mean way. Right. But part of it was because you know this about me. If somebody is sensitive about something, I have an inherent ability to sense what somebody is sensitive about and never let it go. We know. Like never. Oh, I know. And it's not like I'm. I, it's not like I'm purposefully being mean. I just can't, I can't stop focusing on it. Mm-hmm. And Tiffany, she hates nicknames. And so I could never stop not nicknaming her. How lucky. And for making her. the nicknames more and more outlandish, but oh not to her. Right. We never like, we would have a fight over, you know, the last popsicle. And then I would be like, you're, you're Niffer. Like I went, it wasn't like that. But when my mom and I would have a conversation about Tiffany, we would call her Niffer. Wow. That's true. Or Niffy. Or Fiffer. For Fiffy. Oh, my God. You guys are so horrible. I know. It's not good. And no, it's not good at all, honestly. But you know what's funny about this, of the sort of DNA as destiny? Yeah. So my mom's biological father and his kids so he you know my uh, maternal grandfather knocked up my grandmother doris right and then doris gave my mother up for adoption he didn't even know my mother existed right till you know my mom was like 40 like quite a long time and uh anyway so he was already engaged to another woman when he knocked up doris and uh, by the time Doris found out she was pregnant, they were married, whatever. It was already, it was too late to bring up this conversation. And uh, his wife was, uh, like, p- got pregnant on their honeymoon. Like, they were they were overlappingly pregnant. Like, gotcha. that's how tight this timeline was. Anyway, uh, but she did not like nicknames. But he and the kids had a nickname for her. Like a name that they called her behind her back, and she hated it. Oh no! What yeah. was it? But the thing was, is that like, uh, we kind of come by this, like this thing about Tiffany hating her nickname, and then us like nicknaming her anyway. There is a genetic family situation here that what my mom didn't grow up with them, so it's not like she grew up in this tradition right. of having this thing. But yeah. They, uh, I can't remember what the name was that they had for her, but, um, but it was different from her first name, but they would call her this other name and she knew about it and she hated it. And then they, Poor they did thing. it. I know. I know. Plus her husband slept with somebody else while they were engaged what? and had a baby out of wedlock. She had a lot of reason to be upset. I'm not going to lie. Uh, okay. You know, and my sister has a lot of reason to be upset now about us calling her Niffy, but she's pretty resigned to it now. I see. It's been a long time. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, I guess I, I would be bad if I had some kind of um, horrible nickname. I'd be like, no. I mean, I mean, Grody Rody was pretty fucking bad, but I at least 
I dealt with it. It was fine. It wasn't the end of the world. So, And it's not like now I call you Grody all the time or anything. No. If you did that, I would punch you in your face. No. <laughs> I call you Ro. Or Patterson, which is fine. Either or one Patterson, of those is fine. But yeah. I, that, I have to do that to get your attention. Yeah. Yeah, because that's the only thing that gets my attention. Yeah. We have already determined that uh, that's what my father used to say to get our attention, and it worked very well. But I can't, I don't want the, I don't want, the problem is in op- in opening this door, because frequently I need to get your attention yeah. when we're in a crowded space, yes. like on a cruise or something. And so the listeners there, if they know that this is how to get your attention, the problem is then they'll start using it. Mm-hmm. And because it already, because we have talked about this before, already sometimes I'll have to say Patterson two or three times before you hear well, it. Well, you don't say it right. That's well, the, I that's don't. Why. I'm not angry. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's why. Yeah. I'm like, I, when my dad would say then it, it was always like. So when my dad would use that, when he would use Patterson, it usually was if like he was the coach, right? Yeah. So like if he was coaching my basketball team, which he did, uh, he never called me Romaine ever. He only ever called me Patterson, and uh, and part of it I think it was to distinguish, like to make it like so that it was like a disconnect for him for me so that it didn't feel like he was giving me special treatment or whatever. So if he screamed Patterson at you, you had to listen because that was the coach talking kind of thing. That's but how- he called you Patterson at home too, right? Sometimes, yeah. Usually when I was in trouble, though. <laughs> Most people growing up called me Ro. And it's funny because sometimes um, when I'm typing an email and I just want to do a quick response... I'll type out Roe. I'll do R-O-E. And then I'll realize most people don't know me as Roe. And then I'm like, ugh. And then I have to type out my whole name and it annoys me because I just want to write Roe. Or sometimes I'll just write R. Because sometimes I'm like, ugh, typing my whole name is a lot of letters. It's too many letters. And I'm always now, trying when to you were, it. When you were a kid growing up, yeah. uh, did your parents start to scream out one of your sister's names first and then switch to your name? Oh, yeah, so that happened all the time. So it would be like, Sabina, Simon, Romaine! <laughs> like, it would always be. And I, by the way, I do this at home, too. Not with my child, obviously, but with my pets. So, like, if I'm going to yell at a dog, I will yell four names before I get to the right name. And sometimes I even yell the dead dog's names. Like, I'm just like, God damn it, who am I yelling at right now? Oh, it's bad. I, but I definitely, I definitely do that with the dogs all the time, all the time at my house. I get the dog. I can't remember which dog I'm yelling at. I just start yelling dog names until I eventually land on the right one. But, but yes, my mother used to do that all the time. But she had eight kids. I think it was probably harder for her with the boys than it was the girls because there were only three girls. There were five boys. And uh, you know, but then again, she didn't yell at three of them most of the time because they were the gay boys were good. They were well-behaved boys. It was Patrick and Chuck that were the bad boys in the family because they were always getting into some kind of dumb mischief. And I was a good child. I hardly ever got yelled at by my mother. Mostly Sabina and Trish got yelled at because they were bad. I was mostly good. Mostly. <laughs> mostly. I mean, mm, to a point. <laughs> I don't I don't think my mom really knew all the bad stuff I was doing. And even then it was very limited bad stuff. In terms of bad stuff that I could have been doing, I was pretty good. But I'm still amazed sometimes at the things she let me do. Like I'll never forget. It was uh I was like a junior in high school, maybe a senior, maybe a senior. And my friend Danny, she was this super hot blonde girl. And she showed up at my house, or she uh, she did it more than once, but she would show up at my house at like eight or nine o'clock at night on her motorcycle. And she'd be like, oh come God. on, Romaine, we're going for a ride. And I'd climb on the back of her motorcycle and off we'd go. And I'd be holding on tight to this hot fucking lesbian. And, um, and my parents just let me go. I'm like, and I keep thinking back on it. It's like, um, that was stupid. Like, of all the dumb shit my parents let me do, that was probably one of the dumbest things they let me do because we were teenagers and Danny drove that fucking motorcycle fast. Do you at least wear a helmet? Of course I wore a helmet. And I wore my black leather jacket. So, I mean, you know, I had some protection, but not enough. We were dumb. <laughs> Here is the only protection that they were worried about. Danny was not a man. No, well, this is because true. Because let's face it. If it had been Sabina 
and Danny had been a guy. Oh, no, yeah, no. 100%. A hot guy on no. a motorcycle. No, 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 no Yeah, no. Because no. your parents would know she would immediately, she yeah. wouldn't even have to have sex with him. She yeah. would just climb on the back of that motorcycle and be instantly pregnant. Yes. No, I agree. Because I was always hanging out with girls, my parents were a lot a lot more relaxed. But then I think about like my own rules with Romy, right? So Romy yeah. is about the age I was when I was climbing onto the back of these motorcycles and riding off with Danny. And I keep thinking, I won't what? even let my child get in a car where one of her friends is driving. And then but then I'm like, but my parents let me climb on the back of a fucking motorcycle. That was a different time. I mean, I guess it was, but I just think, am I a helicopter parent? Like if I be like Am I too strict? Because I don't let my kid do half the shit my parents were letting me do at her age. We just we have a different safety standard now because we are just way more aware of how dangerous things how are. dangerous various things are. I mean, you yeah. know, think about you know what what got us like seatbelts and the end of drunk driving and whatever else. It was awareness campaigns of how dangerous drunk driving is, how right. dangerous riding a motorcycle without right. a helmet or even riding a bicycle without a helmet or yep. uh, any of these things, seatbelts, all came from safety information. Here's how many people die a year from not wearing a helmet on a motorcycle or not wearing your seatbelt when they drive a car or are killed by drunk drivers. And eventually people realize oh, this is actually really dangerous. Right. We shouldn't do that anymore. Right. And then culturally, we shift. But also, uh, where Romy... To meet, to meet that. Where Romy is growing up is very different than where I grew up. I mean, I grew up in the middle of a state where there were five people. And yeah. there was only so much trouble you really could get into. Whereas Romy is growing up in a state with a lot more people. The roads are much busier and crazier like if i was on the highway in wyoming chances are there were three other people on that highway and that was it romy she can't drive three feet without running into three other people so i feel like they're like from a danger perspective where she's growing up there's much more risk than where i grew up in the middle of fucking nowhere yeah even you know in wyoming because i'm sure there is still uh a fair amount of uh, drunk driving that's going on in Wyoming. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Because the it's a rural area. You the have bars to drive everywhere. are a long way, and there's not an easy taxi or Uber no. or uh, public transportation option. So people are going, and they may not be as drunk on the road as they were 40, 50 years ago. Right. But the idea that people are not hanging out in a bar all night drinking beer and then getting behind the wheel of a car, of course, it's happening all the time. Right. But the reality of uh, these more rural areas is in that situation, you are much more of a danger to yourself. Yes. Driving your own car into a pole or a ditch or, or crashing into things than hitting other people. Right. Because there's just not going to be a lot of pedestrians. There's not going to be a lot of other cars versus where you are now, where drunk driving is. Uh, much more dangerous because there's way more cars on the road, way more pedestrians, just more inherent danger mm -hmm. and risk involved. And it's the same thing for, you know, you're just crossing a street is more dangerous oh, just yeah. from a statistical standpoint because there are just that many more cars. So it's, it is a different environment um, c culturally and also just generally statistically and people here have different options. Like, this was the thing when I first moved to New York. I didn't drink that much when I lived in L.A. Mm -hmm. I would, like, if I, because I lived in West Hollywood. When I lived in West Hollywood, I could walk to the bars. And then I could get as drunk as I wanted. Because right. I was just walking home. I mean, that was how I was in New York City. Right. It was and awesome. I, but I didn't drink a lot when I did not live within walking distance of a bar. Agreed. If somebody else was driving... Like when I uh, lived in Pasadena with M Michael Duggan, I would I could drink because I we were taking his car and he was driving, so I could be a mess if I wanted to be. Even though I had to get up early and go to the drug clinic right. and work there, who I think could smell the liquors on me. Anyway, uh, you know that you know I knew where and when I could drink. But yeah, when I moved to New York. And you were never driving a car in New York. It's like, oh, I could be as drunk as I want to be all the time. And when you come to New York and you see how much people drink, you're like, Jesus Christ. But it's because they're never going to be behind the wheel of a car. Right. So they yeah. can just get. They can get as drunk as they fucking bullet. want. I mean, and I used to get yeah. 
blotto drunk when oh, I was in God. New York City because you didn't have any risk in terms of getting home. There were other risks, but not right. uh, not that. Oh my God! What a oh, mess. Man. Anyway, we were good fun. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, speaking of kids, you know the SATs recently made a big change. Oh, did they? They did. Uh, the SATs have uh, been going electronic. So you remember, we had the Scantron mm-hmm. multiple choice number two pencil. Yeah. But they have changed the test uh, to make it uh, digital. Oh, interesting. Uh, they have shortened some of the like essay portions of it. Right. Um, but uh, part of the uh, appeal of doing it is they have randomized the questions. Mm. So that it's harder for people to cheat because mm. you can't look over like, oh, they're on page 10. I'm on page 10. Right. What did they just put down as the answer? Oh, that's smart. Right. Uh, and there was some concern about like how it would go over having the more electronic version of the SAT. Right. But apparently the students liked it. Huh. They liked it better. And well, probably because they're fully digital. Oh, so yeah. So the old... <laughs> Pencil thing probably drove them nuts. Well, because like Romy was, Romy's been taking these tests uh, recently for um, like these state required tests for graduation, and they're all digital, all of them. And like you have to come in with your Chromebook fully charged and ready to go, and it's a whole thing. Um, and Romy, I mean, that's all they've known. Like uh, Romy doesn't even use to take notes at school. Romy doesn't use a notebook. Romy doesn't carry around a notebook like you and I used to for each class. Romy literally carries around a computer and goes into the Google Docs or whatever for her classes, and that's where she takes all of her notes. Everything is digital now. It's so it's so different than when, like, they don't even have textbooks, Derek. It's so crazy how they do things now. It's completely, completely different versus when you and I were kids and in school. And sometimes I find it very confusing as a parent because I'm like, how am I supposed to keep up with this shit? In a way, I feel bad for these kids because, like, you know, when I when we were failing classes, okay, by me, you probably weren't because you're Mr. Smarty Pants. But when I would like be failing a class, my parents didn't get <laughs> did, they didn't get an email that said, "Hey, your kid didn't turn in this homework assignment." I get an email for every zero that gets entered into. Uh, you know, Romy's things for every class. And then I ask her every day, I'm like, why am I getting a zero in your mathematic class? What did you not turn in? And then she gets mad at me. She's like, how do you know? And I'm like, because I get an email. I get, I signed up. I I know when you're not doing your work. It makes her crazy. So I think if for some ways, if for some kids, it's, life is harder now that everything's digital because you can't get away with shit. Yeah, that would have been a disaster for my sister, Tiffany. Yeah. Not for me. Right, because you're I... Mr. Smarty Pants. Well, I You're like really, Iris. I only had one subject that I really struggled in, and it and it's uh, chemistry. No, oh, I hated chemistry. And I hated chemistry, and uh, part of it because uh, I I see it now yeah. that I'm an adult and cooking. Mm. That it really my <laughs> issue with chemistry is the precision. Yeah, I'm not a precision person, and chemistry requires precision no oh, fuck chemistry and ex- and being exact it isn't just learning the periodic tables and you know what interacts with what and all those kinds of things and bonds and, and it the core of it the where i struggled was in the precision and exactness of it where i did fine in chemistry was the math because there was a lot of math in chemistry and that's fine i was always good in math so the only reason I got out of chemistry with a gentleman C, uh, it was my worst subject, but did not fail. I got close when I was in the seventh grade. The first time I had a real chemistry class in the seventh grade, yeah. I was on the brink of failure. And what saved me from failing that class was at Christmas, I went back to California and went to a new school. Oh. If I had stayed that school year, yeah, I probably would, would have... I mean, I probably would have been forced to sort of get a D yeah. or something, but I really, I really was not getting chemistry. Anyway, but uh, yeah, it was only because it was a multiple choice test, mm. and so much of it was math, and I was usually able to narrow it down to two of the four choices. Because I'm pretty, fifty-fifty. You know, i I would take I would I would take the test versus 
Like I was, what I was, what I was doing was working the test as opposed to working the problems. Right. Like I would know how the teacher would structure the test in a multiple choice environment. And I could narrow down the choices. And then based on the T te- the pattern of Dr. Sue's uh, teaching, I could then better guess what the test was, but I wasn't learning anything except how, how to, to strategically guess <laughs> my chemistry teacher and how she structured a uh, test. That's funny. So in some ways, like, well, you know, if I were, if I were less smart, yeah, I probably would have failed chemistry, but I didn't really learn anything in chemistry except how to game a system. That's what I learned in chemistry, I mean, and I got to see. Fair. And I think, as you've seen how my life has gone, that's pretty much how it went. But I did well on the SATs. I mean, you know, Jonathan, uh, RIP, he had a perfect SAT score. What? Uh, but, oh, yeah. Didn't I tell you this before? No. Yeah, Jonathan, this is the thing. He grew up poor in outside Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. And he got a perfect SAT score. And because of that, he had like the best SAT score in his year in Florida. And because of that, he got a full ride scholarship to Johns Hopkins. Wow. Like he had, I think he had good grades too, but he got a perfect SAT score. And that is what got him out of his like homophobic small town and got him a degree from a fancy university, but he wanted to go into entertainment and Johns Hopkins was not like the perfect place to go for entertainment, obviously. Right. Uh, But even still a fancy degree is a fancy degree and that's how he got in life. But like I got a 1260 in my SATs, 640 verbal, 620 math, which is a good, I didn't study. Uh, You ask anybody I went to high school with, I was not a, well, I got to knuckle down and really study. If I had studied for the SATs, I probably would have done better. I don't, I wouldn't have gotten a perfect score, Um, but uh, I didn't study at all. And my friend Bernadette, who, you know, went on to get a master's degree at Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, She, um, yeah, I did better than she did on the SATs. But like we were, we were in chemistry together. She sat behind me in chemistry and she, studied and worked hard. She also had trouble with chemistry. Like it was not her like strong suit, whatever. And when we would consistently get the same grade and I was reading a novel while she was studying and paying attention. I would want to punch you in the face if I was her. Yeah. She, she wanted to kill me. She's a good person. See, that was always woman. That was always me. I'd study, 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 and I would only do okay. And then there were people I know who didn't study, who fucking killed it. And I just, it would make me furious. Yeah. So she, she hated me. She hated me a lot. I hate you. Like that really, she really (laughs) hated me. But I, but I think she was frustrated of like, how come I can't, how, cause she is smart and very capable and, uh, you know, one of the most terrific people I know, but like there was just, like, I just had this ability to uh, like skate through in something like this. But yeah, when our SAT scores came out, cause she studied, she had like a study group and she did the practice tests and ev- like the whole thing, all the college prep things that they tell you to do. Cause she wanted to go to a real university. She had right. plans for herself. Not like me where I was like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And uh, when our test scores came back, she was like, oh, my God, you have to go to a guidance counselor. Like, you could actually go to a real college. You have a real SAT score. You could, you should go to a real college. Wow. Because I think she got, like, 1,100 and change, right. something like that. And studied. And really, if you break 1,000, that's what they're looking for. Mm. And uh, but I know people who did much better on the SATs than I did. And this is not like a, oh, look at how smarty pants I am or anything mm. like I got I got a I got a solid SAT score, but I'm not like the I didn't get anywhere near the top SAT score in my school, let alone my state the way that Jonathan did. But uh, yeah, I did fine. And when I went to a guidance counselor, they were like, yes, have you considered going to Oberlin? <laughs> They have a nice theater department there in Ohio. Mm. Think about how my life would have changed if I had gotten into Oberlin. Yeah, like what a different. different yeah. What a different life my life would have been. Yeah, probably. Probably. Yeah. 
It's a good thing I didn't. Yep. I'd probably still be saddled with student debt. Oh, God, And yes. I'd probably be mm-hmm. still working off-Broadway as a untalented and unsuccessful performer. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> that's really sad, Derek. <laughs> well, I really don't think I had enough. I obviously can't sing. And, uh, I mean, with a little, like, vocal, with some vocal training, I could probably barely carry a tune you know what i mean like uh-huh. un- enough to you know passably sing something in a movie or something in the back gotcha. like not a i was never going to be a singer and i wasn't good at choreography when i was in high school either. is that what we rich adam is going to tell us is all the things you were not good at <laughs> yeah, yeah and I, like as a, from an acting standpoint i was fine but i never got much better than the audition like i was gotcha. good in the audition but i did not improve beyond I like see. i because you know because we'll do things where you have to like cold read something yeah and i'm good at just like cold reading through something yeah you're pretty good at it but i don't get better like if i keep doing it i'm not i don't get better significantly better than the first take so i i definitely had limitations as a performer <laughs> That I don't think getting a degree from Oberlin would have changed. Gotcha. But what it would have changed is I would have had forty thousand dollars in student debt, probably. Oh, at least. And uh, and then no way to work it off. <laughs> Yay! Life is. But good. the good news is I did a terrible job with my application because I really didn't put a lot of effort into it, and then I was devastated when I got a rejection letter. Mm. <laughs> I was so surprised. Like, how could they reject me? Yeah, when I. Did so little effort here. Yeah. I don't think I got yeah. any rejection letters. Well, I really only applied to Oberlin. And then when I got rejected, I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to go to a state school with lower standards because it's too late now. By the time I got the rejection letter, it was whatever, March of my senior year. Mm-hmm. It's too late for me to apply. I only That was the only school I applied to because that was the one that the guidance counselor recommended. Girl. I probably because it was like, you're obviously a homosexual. Why don't you go to this college where you're going to meet other homosexuals? Probably. Yeah. Wow. I really don't know why they recommended Oberlin. I'll be honest. Probably because they had a theater department. Probably. And they knew that my grades and my SAT were not good enough to get to NYU or Yale Drama School right. or anything else. That's for the stars. <laughs> <laughs> Such a dick. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I did my best. You, and Actually, your that's best not was even true. Good. No, I didn't do my best. I half-assed my way through everything, but I had enough like natural momentum that yeah. it propelled me Forward. to where I ended up going. But yeah. I cannot say I did my best. I really can't, because I honestly didn't. Okay. I, I could have done better. I could have studied more. I could have had a plan. I, res- I resisted the obvious paths ahead of me. You know, I resisted learning computers mm. as they were rising, and I knew they were rising, and I was like, no, I will not learn computers. Why Huge does mistake. that not surprise me? Yeah. Because that has defined my whole life. Yeah. No, I will not learn technology. How dare you? Yeah. I'll be the last Luddite left on Earth. This was my plan. It was a bad plan. It was not a good plan. No, Usually you're a plan. better planner than that, Derek. That was not a great plan. No, it was the worst part of my plan. In <laughs> retrospect now, if I could go back in time and talk to me, because there's not a lot of like how I would have changed my life. But really, I should have gone back to 17-year-old me and said, you're a dumb bitch. Don't be a dumb bitch. Don't be a dumb bitch. <laughs> you're being a dumb bitch about computers. Don't be a dumb bitch. Learn everything you can learn about computers yeah. because you will retire at 29. Yeah, you could have. Dumb. Yeah. You dumb Because if I had gotten into computers earlier and I had really, like, I could have jumped into any number of startups in the 90s and early 2000s. Yeah, because you were positioned to very easily. I was well positioned to. And if I had a little more technical savvy, I probably could have risen pretty fast in any number of these environments and, uh, you know, would have hit more of a stock option jackpot than I did. Right. Uh, and probably could have fully retired in my late 20s. Shame. Like so many people that I know did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it was my own it was my own stupidity. And by the way, the these opportunities kept presenting themselves and I was like, no, thank you. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> well, this is how we learn. 
I know. Well, we're going to learn a lot more about what a dumb teenager I was uh, when we talk to my old pal, Rich Haddam, about his brand new podcast. Mm. I know. Uh, it's new and it's interesting. And we're going to find out all about it next here on Derek and Romaine. VNR 2.0. 2.0. Uh, Derek here, along with Romaine, and uh, joining us from Glamorous Hollywood, USA, Richard Haddam is uh, back with us. He has a new podcast, <laughs> Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf. Uh, it is available now everywhere you get your podcasts after its recent debut on March 25th. Uh, you can uh, follow uh, it on Instagram, Paranormal Bookshelf Pod on Instagram. And uh, Richard is Haddam Richard on Instagram, and he is Richard Haddam on Twitter. Uh, but I still call him Rich after all these years. <laughs> Rich Haddam, hello. Welcome back to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I, I feel like a member of the family. I feel like I just hang out with you guys. Uh, well, we did recently hang out, actually, in person. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I did. I know. And I hadn't seen. It had been a, it had been a long time. Like, I, I, when long. I saw you, I realized... Oh, we have not been in the same room in a while because even at the even at the reunions, like the uh, the the thespian reunions and stuff, you're usually uh, you're you're zooming in. Yes, well, the right the last time I did, I zoomed in, uh, and everybody else was in person, and then I was on like a tablet on heather's uh <laughs> coffee table or something it was a that was a very weird experience i have to say um i felt like what i imagine the ai version of me will feel like 50 years from now but uh when they <laughs> when they when they clone me and resurrect me uh that's what it will feel like oh, i can't believe i'm trapped in this box feels a little strange you know what that might have felt weird, but nothing is weirder than actually being at those things in person. There isn't enough alcohol in the world. <laughs> uh, now, uh, because it came up earlier on the show, uh, I still call you Rich, but obviously professionally you go by Richard Haddam. So my question is, does anyone else still call you Rich or am I literally the last person left alive? I think you know the answer. No, no, no. Uh, you know, everyone who knows me calls me Rich. And okay. the people who have known me for a long, long time call me Richie. Right. But the, I always start with Richard because I, I can't hear when people talk and they'll say their name and I'll mishear it. And if I say Rich, they'll think it's Mitch or Rick or, or Bitch, you know. <laughs> and, and I figure I'm going to start with Richard and then we'll just see where this relationship goes. Okay. Now I just want to call you bitch. <laughs> that's, that's even beyond rich. That's when you're really close. Uh, so we did, uh, I got to meet you and your lovely wife. Uh, and we had lunch together when we were out in California, uh, you know, a couple months ago. And it was terrific. I had a great time. Oh, yeah, that that was the best. Well, uh you know, we got to find out what it really is you do for a living, which up until now had been entirely theoretical. And uh, as it turns out, it's a, apparently it's a real show. So it's good to know. Uh, yeah, I actually, I really, I first of all, I came away feeling awful because, um, uh, well, we had, a, we had a lovely time. It was a lovely legend. But uh, I can tell that you're a writer. Always, always my... My wish is always that when people have lunch with me, they come away feeling awful. Well, no, I really felt like I talked too much about myself. What? And I, I am a, right. See, this will come as a surprise to n no one because I love talking about myself. You I have a, do? Yeah, I've uh, built this shrine to myself for five days a week where I could just talk about myself all day. And um, but I did. I was like, I actually wanted to hear more about. You and Susan. And then when I left, I was like, I, I have unanswered questions. But, you know, we'll have to get together again and hear more about you. But you're such a, I could tell you're a writer because you're very inquisitive about other people and things. And you're interested in, like, how things come together and all that kind of stuff. And I feel like this is all, oh, yeah. this is an important part of being a good writer, being a good actor of like really getting into why things are what they are. Well, I mean, yeah, there is that also. Look, I, Derek, I tend to feel the same way you do. Like I, I talk a lot too, 
Um, for the listener at home, just so you know, if you have lunch with Derek, it's basically just like listening to the show yep. only in person. Yeah. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, if ever if you're ever lucky enough to, I don't know, be on a cruise ship or something, you're gonna get you're gonna get a hundred percent from Derek. Okay, he doesn't show up with at, at half speed. But yeah, I wanted to know. I wanted to know about like. Because I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the fact that you do this every single day. It's crazy. And that to me is amazing. It's crazy, you guys. I don't know how you do it. Lots of practice. Yeah, but I, but I also, I feel that way about writing. Because I, you know, I enjoy writing, but, you know, I've been, I've been noodling around in the same pilot for like five years now. So it's not productive. <laughs> and so I'm always amazed, like when you see like a, like a Aaron Sorkin, you know, cranking out, you know, 20 scripts a year. And, or, and I just think, what? How is that even uh, humanly possible? But I think it's I think it's true of any kind of job where from that can seem impossible that a person can do it to anyone who is outside. But it is when you're in it and you're in the rhythm of doing it, it just is totally natural. And that's just how the job is, I think. Well, you, uh, uh, probably both of you, but Derek, you know, and me, you kind of find what your, what your default is. And if you're smart and you're lucky, that becomes what you do for a living, because that's the kind of thing you can do no matter what. You can do it when you've got the flu. You can do it the day after you get divorced. You can do it, you just... I, I just turn it on. And, you know, there's singers and dancers and actors and writers and all kinds of people that somehow that's their default. They can do it. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's people whose default is organization. And, you know, they can they can walk into any office on Earth and, and get it running up to, you know, 100 percent speed in, in the course of an afternoon. And or, or you, you hand them something mechanical, they can take it apart in the dark and put it back together. That's not me. I cannot do that. I don't want to do that. I don't like to do that. But there are people, thank God, that's their default. And they have made their default their career. And and in, in a way, that is the definition of happiness. So I, I am curious about you jumping into the podcast space because – uh, your wife uh, launched this 80s TV ladies podcast, which has been... You didn't uh, sing it, Derek. I'm disappointed. 80s TV ladies. <laughs> uh, and it is a big success. You know I'm a big fan. And um, and so, uh, one, how does your wife feel about you muscling in on her act, A? And B, uh, you are frequently, it's a two-part question, and you are frequently a guest on other people's podcasts. <laughs> so how does it feel now uh, actually doing your own? Well, it feels great. Um, and yes, uh, Susan definitely, although she's far too kind a person to say it, I think there is a part of her that's like, really? Again? <laughs> because this happens, this happens all the time. She'll start doing something. She'll be like bike riding for years. And all the be making fun of her and, oh, you're going on your bike ride? You know, and she goes and does it. And then she leaves, like, goes to New York for a couple of weeks to, you know, to rehearse a play. And by the time she gets back, I've been riding her bike every single day, bought my own, and I'm now doing twice the number of miles per day that she ever did. And she's like, why did you, why, why did this happen? I'm never leaving you alone with my things again. <laughs> I got to so, be honest, so she, if if Romaine's wife suddenly decided that she was going to do her own podcast, I'd murder her, murder her. I don't think Romaine can handle it. <laughs> I don't think I actually I probably could, but because I know it wouldn't be any good. <laughs> Is that mean of me to yeah. say? Well, actually, I'm a horrible person. Yeah. No, and maybe, maybe that's why Susan hasn't moved out, because Susan's waiting for this thing to crash and burn. But. I, I will say that that our podcasts are very different, and, and my thing is is different than what you guys are doing. For there was there was like a period of time before Susan did her podcast that, and, and you're right. Like I was I was a guest on on other people's things, like usually talking about the paranormal, and because that's the kind of stuff I write. And so there, there'd be you know oh, let's talk about Mothman, let's have you know Richard Hadamon. So I'd go do that. 
And then uh, there were a bunch of things that I was guesting on, and I always had a really good time. And then there was a moment where it was like, well, maybe you should do your own podcast where you, you know, talk about TV writing and you talk to other TV writers. And I was like, that's a great idea. And then I didn't immediately do it. And then suddenly two years go by, and then there's 600 of those. (laughs) So then I was like, you know what? All we're doing is being guests on each other's podcasts. And, you know, I I guess the, the podcast train has moved on. But then, and then Susan started hers, and I still didn't want to do it. I still had no interest. I'm like, you're awesome. Do your podcast. That's the best. And then something happened just about 11 months ago that changed everything. And in the course of a month, something happened, and suddenly the podcast was born. Mm. Uh, was it your wife winning all those podcast awards? That's what it was. Or... <laughs> That's exactly what it was. <laughs> No, 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 no. It was, it was, it was even weirder and, uh, and less, less uh, self-aggrandizing than that. Um, I had, there's a group, uh, in the UK called the, um, Association for the Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomenon, Mm. UK. That sounds fancy. they had been, oh, it's super fancy. And it's been around for decades. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a new thing. And they're a really cool group. They're different than a lot of American groups because they're not, they're not all about like, you know, let's go break into the abandoned insane asylum and spend the night and do an EVP. They're more about, they're almost a step back from that. They're like, let's study this stuff and let's bring in science and let's, you know, take a, a calm, cool, measured approach. Now, these are really fun people and they know how to party, but they're not all looking for their own reality TV show. So they, one of them got in touch with me because they'd heard me on a couple of podcasts and said, hey, you know, once a month we have a guest speaker. Do you want to be a guest speaker? And I was like, yeah, sure. And they're like, you can talk about Mothman. You can talk about the movie, which is easy because I can just talk about that. So, so I did that. And then, and then about six months later, they said, well, do you want to come back and do it again? And I said, well, I'm out of stuff because I told you everything I could about, you know, meeting Richard Gere. So I'm out of stories. And they were like, no, no, just talk about like, you know, you know, you like supernatural stuff. Just, just pick a subject and, and, and do a talk. And I'm like, oh, great. But that's when I realized, oh, I have to write this down like a speech. So I spent a month writing like a a 40 page, one hour address that I was basically going to give them over Zoom. And and, and at the same time, I was like, well, I can talk about the thing, but I'm no expert. So I might as well just talk about something that's got like a connection to my life. And so I talked about a book and, a, and, a, and this weird phenomenon, uh, a thing called the Spiricom, that I'd sort of known about my whole life. And it had come in and out of my life at different points. So I talked about my life and I talked about this book. And I did the talk and it went well. And then it was over. And I was sort of like, God, I spent all this time doing this thing, and now it's just done. Okay, so that's part one. Then it is Susan's fault because then Susan, <laughs> about a week, <laughs> about a week later, Susan comes up and was telling me that she had just been to some conference about podcasting, and she's like, "Oh, I know what all the big uh, podcasting genres are, uh, and the biggest one is." And then I yell true crime. And she goes, no, you're wrong. The biggest ones are the celebrity ones, followed by lifestyle, you know, meditation and wellness and all that kind of stuff. And then I'm like, okay, then after that, it's yours, right? It's like people talking about movies and TV shows. And she says, no, no, that's actually way down. That's not as popular as I thought it was. She's like, even above that, actually, is true crime followed very closely by paranormal. Like, if you did a podcast, it should not be about TV writing. It should be, you know, called, you know, Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf. And you just talk about your books. <laughs> and that was it. Instantly, it all came together. I'm like, oh, my, oh, my God. Wait, that's what I just did. I think I know what this is. And instantly, I knew what it was. And, and that is now what it is. I write these things. They they're about 30, 45 minutes, usually about 45 minutes. It's just me. They're written. 
they're funny, they're scary, but they're all about a true paranormal book that I have on my bookshelf. And they're also about a particular time in my life, a thing that was happening, a lesson I learned. So it's sort of personal journal, personal storytelling from the paranormal. It's like I told you, it's sort of someone said it was paranormal David Sedaris. Mm -hmm. So I said, fine, I'll take it. How many paranormal books do you own? Well, according to my website, it's 1,003. How many would your wife uh, say you own? <laughs> <laughs> what is this, the newlywed game? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to hear her guesstimate on this subject. I'm going to assume more than 1,000, but yes. Uh, no, I don't have more than 1,000. I have a few hundred, uh, but um, but it'll... Uh, but yeah, my, my, we do, uh, or I do, uh, 10 episodes a season. So we started on March 25th. We'll go to the first 10 will run out sometime in July, take a break, do 10 more. Every two weeks, they come out. And uh, so far, the response has been great, uh, better than I expected, in fact. So, um, so it's been, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad it's gone as well as it's gone. And it's been I, really fun, and people have been really nice. So uh, I... I am curious from your experience standpoint, because uh, you uh, you wrote the screenplay for Mothman Prophecies based on a book. And uh, and then you also worked on uh, Titans uh, on Max, which is also, you know, based on previous material. Uh, but in both cases, uh, you know, you have there is a uh, there is a core fan base there that you are uh, working with. And then since the movie, since the Mothman Prophecies movie came out. Uh, you have this whole following uh, with the movie uh, that you are now uh, connected with, that you have this like devoted core uh, fan group uh, around. So I am curious from your point of view, like when you started out as a writer, did you expect that you would engage in uh, would end up engaging in properties like this that would have like an enduring uh, connection that people would have to it. And what has your experience been, uh, you know, in, in the in this world uh, as a as a writer, seeing the the life of this uh, continue on outside of uh, your original work? Well, I can definitely say that I had always hoped it would. I think I think every writer. Uh, and every performer, podcaster, you know, anybody wants a connection with their audience in some way. I think there's some that don't. There's some that want to hide behind a wall and, you know, sort of toss the material over and put it out there. But they, they, they don't want to engage with humans. I feel very fortunate that 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 group exists and that I know they exist and there's a way for them to interact with me. You know, it's weird because it's. You, the three of us had been born 40 years earlier. None of this would be happening. If, it, you know, you guys, well, yeah, it might be happening for you because you might be doing radio and, and, and be in contact with your audience. But people who were writing television 40 years ago had no way to know if they were popular outside the Nielsen ratings. That's no true. one knew what they looked like. They mm -hmm. weren't. They weren't actors, so you, it's like they could walk down the street and maybe you'd, they'd overhear someone talking about the Mary Tyler Moore show or something, and they'd sort of smile to themselves and go, ooh, I write for that show. But how often is that going to happen? But now in, in this social media age, anything I do, I write one episode of some show that only lasts 13 episodes, and every once in a while I do get people, oh, I love that show, I loved your episode. And then for things like Supernatural or Grimm or Titans, and then, of course, Mothman prophecies. People, people reach right out, and it's like, wow. Because by the way, when Mothman prophecies came out, it was not a hit. It was not a financial hit. It was not a critical hit. Mm -hmm. It sort of came out, did its week or two, and went away. And and I was disappointed. I was like, well, again, I guess I guess that's that. But in the twenty years that have passed, it's found its audience, and that audience. It's like a cult thing. And then they reach out, and these are the people who really love it. And it's like, oh, my God, that's so great. And I'm lucky enough that I get to now hear that. So now, now when I think of the movie, I don't, I don't get a stab of, of shame or failure. I feel like, yeah, okay, it wasn't Jurassic Park, but there's a, there's a big group of people out there who saw that movie 
and got what I was trying to say. And I'm grateful for that. So yeah, I'm, I consider myself very lucky. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is interesting what captures people's imagination. And yeah, in the past, it was. I think it was harder for uh, creative people, whether it was actors or writers or directors, to necessarily feel or know what people were connecting to. I think sort of one of the one of the the earliest things in 20th century pop culture that I think that. Uh, you know, that uh, like a, a celebrity became aware of is uh, something like uh, B- uh, Betty Davis uh, in uh, Beyond the Forest saying, what a dump. And that having its own <laughs> like afterlife as a line of dialogue that she, you know, because she said herself, oh, I, I if I had known people would be quoting this for the rest of my life. I would have put a little more into the line reading. You know what I mean? Um, Because you never have, you never know what people are going to like attach to, but it was harder, you know, in this case, you know, she had a big gay following. So obviously it ended up in who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. And, you know, it was off to the races from there. Uh, But, but yeah, before social media, there wasn't really a way for people to uh, connect with uh, a piece of media, especially one that had not been broadly popular, uh, in yeah. and t- to keep that to keep that going, and uh, really, I mean, I feel like the sort of the first sort of inkling of this in our modern era was uh, there was a, a small movie that came out in the I want to say the mid '80s uh, called FX, a Brian Brown movie where he was like a special effects oh, guy. Yeah. Uh, and the movie was not a hit at the box office and then it went out on home video and then it became this such a huge hit in home video that the studio then turned around and made a sequel like six, whatever it was five, six years later. Do you remember that? It's so crazy, but that I, I totally remember that. And again, it was because of this new, this new technology that suddenly came along that did not exist that, that allowed for a film's popularity to be instantly visible. Like you knew, it's like, well, this is the one that's getting rented. This is the one that's getting watched. And, you know, people who like money were able to go, hey, there's there's an audience out there that did not exist, but exists now because of the VHS. Let's go, let's go after them. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's really great. And it allows people who, it allows, it allows for career longevity. It allows for career variety. I mean, look, I don't know what this podcast is going to do. I, I, I don't think this is going to be what I'm going to live off of, although that would be amazing. But, but it's out there for people to enjoy. And, and I can still write TV and I can still write movies and I can still do other things. And it's just, it's just another way to reach people. And for me, like this is the most direct, like you know, I wrote on Titans, but Titans is its own thing. I have never done a lot of autobiographical stuff. This is super autobiographical, and it's really fun, and it's a different kind of writing than I've ever done. I'm I'm really enjoying it, and so it it turns another card over in in sort of like you know my my hand of the things that I can do. And um, and now it's out there too, and people can um, can react to it in in whatever way means the most to them. Do you now, find you... it easier or harder writing for the podcast than writing for TV? Um, in a weird way, easier because it it it's a podcast. So in a way, it can be anything I want it to be. It's funny when I when I started last summer, I was writing these you know these stories, these essays, these things, and. Um, and I was like, well, you know, some of them might be an hour. Some might only be a half an hour and some might be this way. And some might be that way. I've already found that I'm beginning to, uh, make them a little bit the same. It's sort of like, well, but it should be, I should put a little bit more of the book in this one or, huh, this was a little bit too much book. I I better put something about me and find a way to connect to it in this one. So I'm already sort of leaning toward my TV writing uh, muscle memory of, Mm. okay, act one's got to end right here. So I do try to step back from that and go, you know what? It doesn't matter. It can be whatever it is. 
Uh, but I find it I find it way easier because there are no rules, and also there's no one else involved. It's just me. I write them. That's the script. I record them. That's it. My composer writes music that that makes it come alive that I just absolutely adore. His name is Nima Kazaruni. He's an Iranian uh, a composer and a, a music maker in Torrance. He's got five different bands. He's all over Spotify. Now he's doing my stuff. It's like, it's just, it's pure collaboration, pure creativity. It's pure fun. Uh, so with uh, with the rise of these streaming services, though, the half hour, hour uh, model uh, has really gone away. So as somebody who has been, uh, you know, writing for a long time and doing a lot of television, uh, how do you do? Do you like that there is now more flexibility in how long and or short an episode can be, or do you think there is uh, real value and benefit in the sort of uh, trying to make something work in uh, forty-two minutes or uh, twenty-one minutes? Um, for me, the latter. Uh, I, I do think, and, and frankly, look, even with Titans, when we started, we thought, oh, this is great. This is, you know, streaming. We can do whatever we want. We can have an hour long episode, a 45 minute episode. It doesn't matter. Turns out totally matters <laughs> because it's being produced. <laughs> it's being produced by Warner Brothers and it's going to it's going to sell on a million different platforms all the way around the world. And so they were still, yeah, you can do whatever you want. But ultimately, one day. These will play from nine o'clock to 10 o'clock on some channel in Greece and, you know, Dubai and uh, Brazil. So don't go too crazy. And so we ended up writing an hour long show. The other ones, though, are, are kind of cool, but I do weirdly think that people want shows to sort of be the same when Ted Lasso was suddenly it was a half hour show that suddenly started doing hour long episodes. And I was a Ted Lasso fan and I was a fan of both, but I sort of thought it's a little weird. The, 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 the timing and the flow works differently for an hour long story as compared to a half hour story. Mm -hmm. And there's just a traditionalist inside me that felt like, you know what? stick closer to your model that's just going to work it's going to help creators create the show but it's also going to help the audience watch the show because they're going to know how to watch it uh yeah i mean my feeling is the audience should either be left hungry or satisfied but not full um just because <laughs> like you know unless it's over you know uh but uh, yeah, I, you know, there's a, definitely has been a lot of talk of like three hour long movies Ugh. of, you know, how necessary is it for a, a movie to clock in over, you know, two and a half hours. And uh, I I mean, a lot of it depends on, you know, what you have to say. Sometimes you have two and a half hours of something to say or three hours of something to say. No, you uh, don't. But m most of the time <laughs> you don't. Uh, and I, I, I. I think less is more like all the time. And, um, yeah. uh, but, but, you know, Louise Brooks said something that, uh, you know, as a writer, uh, early on, she got a, you know, she was broke and she got a job writing, uh, uh, little like blind item things for Walter Winchell's column. And they had to be very short and she hated it. Because it was like, this can't be more than whatever it was, 18 words or something insane. Like, it, all, all the things had to be very, very short. Uh, but she said it made her a better writer, uh, being forced to, uh, like, pick every word carefully because she did not have that many words to work with. Uh, and that later on, it served her really well as a writer because she she could do things more economically because she had already uh, learned how to do that. So I think that sort of the... Uh, as much as people may, you know, chafe at the structures of uh, movies and TV shows, the reality is when you know the structure, it's really beneficial because then you can know what when to throw something away uh, if you don't need it in that moment. Because, you know, you know, like in building a house, you can remove one beam because you know what it's supporting or not supporting. Uh, but if you don't know the structure, then you're just going to create a mess. <laughs> 
Well, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I teach a class at UCLA and uh, it's in television writing. And I got to tell you, the last 10 years have not made my job easier because no matter what I say, someone goes, well, that's not how they do it on succession, yeah. you know, or, well, you know, that's not how Barry does it. And it's like, yeah, I know, but it's that, that's not, you know, we're now living in a landscape where you can point at anything and go, well, that's completely different. And that totally contradicts your point, And it still works. And it's like, yes, I know. But, but for, for you, the student who's just learning, it doesn't help you to have no guardrails. It helps you to have a ton of guardrails because the more guardrails you have, the better you get at honing a very specific craft that once you master it, then you can start messing with the rules, but, but don't look at like the, the whole landscape of television and go, there are no rules, which means anything I do is fine. Cause that's not gonna, that's right. not gonna work. People are going to look at that and go, no, people literally, I mean, it's stupid, but they would r literally rather read something that is not wholly original, but is rather a perfect execution of an existing genre. They'd rather read a perfect romantic comedy, perfectly structured with all the steps, the meet cute, the, the second act twist, the whole thing, or a perfectly executed thriller. Because then they know, it's like, oh, this person knows what they're doing. Again, if that's the default, it's like, great. In the middle of the night, I can wake them up and they will know what the end of act three has to look like. Beyond that, though, you can do whatever you want as long as you know the basics. But anyway, yeah. Well, and, and but that's, that's why but, look, it, took me, it took me 40 years to, to, to break out and do something different. Literally, it took 40 years. I've been writing for 40 years doing TV shows, all trying to do the exact same thing. And then last summer, it was like, well, let's try something different. <laughs> I'm on strike. There's nothing to do all day. Let me try something different. For God's sake, it's been 40 years, and it was the greatest thing I ever did. Yeah, but also it was funny because somebody, some, uh, somebody on like t writer Twitter uh, had posted a thing of you know that basically said uh, they're not going to produce your spec script anyway. So you know, basically <laughs> this this thing, you you know. You know, you might as well just show them that you know how to work in a three act structure because the producer who reads it all, already has in mind their terrible idea that they want you to write. So ultimately, yeah, they just exactly. want to know, are there any <laughs> typos right. in here? Are there any typos in here? Is the does the page formatted properly? Does it have a solid three act structure? Can they develop a character over time? Is there anything funny in here? Because they're instead going to say, oh, my God, can you please turn this box of Lucky Charms into a 10 episode series? Thank you. Yes, that, that 100 percent correct. You know, so you might as well and try to try to connect with them emotionally. I mean, and that, right. that's, of course, most important. But if you can do it within within a tightly structured, a tightly well-crafted piece of writing, then you're undeniable. And, right. and, uh, and, and you've done everything you can reasonably be expected to do. So. All right. Now, I have one last question for you, actually, mm -hmm. about paranormal things. Oh, okay. Uh, because uh, you, you have read a lot of books around this. And uh, recently, the uh, uh, um, the DOD uh, has been throwing cold water on uh, UFO encounters uh, and everything. There's still unidentified phenomena, but they're but they are insisting there is no Area 51, there is no alien autopsies from the 40s, there is no uh, alien spacecraft that they have been analyzing. So, what do you think uh, is really out there um, um i believe there is a phenomenon going on i believe there are uh unknown things in the sky that people are witnessing people in the military and just you know civilian people i and this is and i've said this before i do not believe that any government possesses any physical item proving the existence of extraterrestrials at all. I think they are as confused and worried as the rest of us. 
Now, what they say and what they do and all of the sort of complicated spy craft and public manipulation for various reasons, that stuff goes on. And and they and the gov I mean it's been it's been proven and documented that there are people within the government who have purposely lied to civilian investigators uh, to for various reasons. So when someone says, no, I, I know the guy who knows the guy who saw the bodies, well, that doesn't mean anything. And look, you know, if I'm wrong, no, no one will remember I ever said this because we'll, we'll be too bowled over by the presence of our alien overlords. <laughs> but my, my theory, look, people are still experiencing weird stuff all the time. And and the one commonality is that whatever those things are, they seem to be a little smarter than us and a little better than us at keeping their true nature mostly hidden. So do you think there's aliens or not? Yes, but I don't think they live on another planet. I think they're coming from somewhere less physical than the world that we live in. And I think they can be physical, but I don't think that is their one and only state. I do not think there is a consistently existing quote unquote planet out there where aliens live, build spaceships and come to visit us. Interesting. Yeah. I, this is, this is what I have been saying. Like, I think it is far more likely that there are uh, like, other other dimensions of space and time around us like there's all this dark matter in the universe and we don't even know what it is there's uh, there is a part of the universe that our our science as we know it now cannot explain what it is and it's like 40 percent of what's around us like it's a lot and so to me it's just like it's foggy outside and we're all guessing what's in the fog but yep. we don't know we just there's a fog and it could be something or it could be nothing. The fog could lift and there could be nothing there or there could be something in the fog and we can't see it because the fog is in the way. Uh, but, I, yeah, I agree. It's far more likely that there are, you know, other other dimensions of time and space around us and that we ourselves just cannot perceive it. Uh, and then every once in a while, you know, we can, for whatever reason, uh, perceive it around us and. Uh, and then, but it's, but yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't last. It doesn't leave anything behind necessarily, but yeah, no. I think, yeah, I, I, I think, I think the, the fog metaphor the, the, is, is a good one. All right. So there you go. I guess we're just all going to be in a fog. <laughs> I guess so. Unless of course we li listen to Rich's new podcast. That's right. Then maybe the, not. That's the right. fog will lift for you. <laughs> One episode I at a time. Lift, <laughs> lifting the fog every every two weeks, uh, Monday mornings is what it uh, is, is when new episodes launch. So you can hear it, uh, yeah, like you said, on any podcast uh, uh, platform, and then uh, and then and then check in with me and let me know what you thought of it. You know, anyone out there who listens to it, uh, uh, shoot me uh, shoot me some thoughts. I'd love it. All right. Excellent. Well, Rich, I always love catching up with you and uh, the, our, our lunch together definitely left me wanting more. So <laughs> I look forward to seeing you again well, yeah, well, uh, when I'm in California. Look, the, the, the next time you see me, it's going to be me and Susan and the four of us are going to be on a cruise ship. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> nice. I like the sounds of that. You know, we have the power <laughs> to make that happen. So, you know. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. And we bring our podcast equipment with us so you guys can record things too, you know. We sure do. Yeah. Oh, thank God. Yeah, because Susan's not going to want to relax with me. She's got work to do. Don't you understand? <laughs> I love it. All right. Uh, uh, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, our thanks to Richard Haddam for being with us. Be sure to check out his brand new podcast, Richard Haddam's Paranormal Bookshelf. It is available everywhere you get your podcasts. It launched uh, last month on March 25th. Uh, so you can jump into it now. And, of course, follow him on Instagram and Twitter. 
Twitter. He is Richard Haddam on Twitter and Haddam Richard on Instagram. And uh, his pod is also on Instagram. It is Paranormal Bookshelf Pod on Instagram. Rich, thanks so much for being with us. Oh, it was so great, you guys. Uh, Love you guys. And uh, we will talk again soon. Can't wait. You're listening to Derek and Romain. Well, there you have it. The end of another perfect episode of Derek and Romaine. And if you want more great fun, go to dnrstudios.com and subscribe to get our show every day. And don't forget, for DNR Plus subscribers, you can use the DNR Cast app for iPhone, available now in the App Store. 